When you play Splendor for the very first time, after hearing the rules explanation, the game flow seems self-explanatory. You draw gems until you can buy cards, then get some more gems to buy some more cards, and again, and again. And when your engine is finally up and running, you start buying some of the more expensive cards. You might then look at the cards in front of you, look to see what sets of gems the nobles are looking for, and aim towards collecting the needed sets so that you can get your points from the nobles and win. That way of playing is fine. That way of playing is good. You'll learn a lot, have lots of fun, and get a better feel for how the game plays. But as you play Splendor more and more, that way of playing isn't what will allow you to win. To win, you'll need to dig a bit deeper and be a bit more ruthless. Hi everyone, my name is Chris and welcome to my board game guides. Today, I'm gonna to walk you through some strategies and tips for Splendor, hopefully to give you some more insight into the game to help you become a better player. So with that, here are some six do's and don'ts that you should definitely think about as you play Splendor so that way you can improve your winning percentage. So let's go for it. We start off with tip number one, do understand the goals and incentives of the game. Remember in the beginning how I was grabbing gems and cards and using that to build the gem card engine? Well, Splendor promotes that type of play. And early on when you're learning the game, you should do just that. But that focus on the engine building may cause you to lose track of Splendor's true objective. As obvious as it may be, the winner isn't the person who builds the splashiest engine. Rather, it is the first person to reach at least 15 points. How you get there is up to you. But you'll need to get there before everyone else, either by playing as efficiently as possible, or finding some other way to slow the other players down. This tip forms the foundation for the rest of the do's and don'ts, so it bears repeating. Understand Splendor's goal, which is to hit 15 points or more. That means the name of the game is Action Efficiency, leading to point number two. Hi guys. All right, so we just talked about hitting 15 points and trying to understand what efficient play looks like. And there's definitely a lot to unpack there. I mean, you might want to ask yourself, how, do, how well do good players perform? And what should I be thinking of in terms of measuring myself so I can be benchmarking myself against the best? Well, for me, the easiest way to think about it is how quickly can you get to 15 points? And you do that by figuring out the number of turns it takes. A good way to practice that would be to play solo games where you're taking turns and counting them one by one. So for example, go through here. Say this is turn number one. Turn number two. Turn number three. and so on. Yeah, it's absolutely not exactly the most fun way to play, but think of that as kind of like the background work you have to do to start getting yourself on the road to improvement. And you'll know you're improving if you can lower the number of turns it takes for you to get to 15 points. Now, once you feel like you've hit that uh, plateau, maybe it's time to start thinking about how other people perform and benchmarking towards players who play really well. And to aid us in that, here is a graph by a Board Game Geek user named Metal. Now, it tells you the number of turns it takes to end an average game of Splendor. And you can see it resembles a bell curve. From this, you can see that most games end somewhere between 26, 27, 28 turns, with a lot of games ending around the 27 turn mark. The implication of that means that if you can somehow end the game by, say, turn 25, you stand a pretty good chance of winning, because if you get there before anybody else does, 
If you can get to that 15 point mark in 25 turns, you're probably gonna win. But if you let it drag on to say 28, 29 turns, you might not be playing as efficiently as possible and there might be a lot of room for improvement. And another thing to think about, and I'll kind of explain this later, is how many cards do most winning players end up with? How many cards do they end up buying? And we see from this other chart, also from Board Game Geek User Metal, is that most people buy around 11 cards, which isn't a whole lot. So what kind of cards should you be buying? Maybe you should figure out which cards to buy to really optimize the number of points you can get for every turn that you take. Of course, with the goal of ending the game within 24, 25 turns, because you do that and you'll do pretty well. Now, don't forget that while you're trying to play as efficiently as possible, you're also trying to disrupt everyone else from playing as efficiently as possible. To do that, we turn to tip number three. Do deny opponents of development cards whenever necessary. The steps to doing so are simple. Look at your opponent's board, then try to figure out from their board state what they might be going for, and then on your turn, reserve the development card they need. At worst, they'll still have to take a turn or two to pivot to a new card. At best, they're stuck with a handful of gems that they can't use because you've deprived them of any good opportunities. Not only will denying your opponents slow them down, the wildcard gem's versatility should not be underestimated because of its ability to give you more options and making it harder for your opponents to stop you. For example, with the wildcard gem in hand, along with some emeralds and rubies, that means you can chase after this red development or this green development card instead of being totally handcuffed into a path that will also tip your next actions to your opponents, allowing them to deny you. So having this flexibility is huge in preventing that. So with these ideas in mind, let's turn to things you shouldn't do when playing Splendor. The first don't that will give you a big edge over new players is this. Don't buy too many cards from the first row unless they provide points. Remember, your goal is not to build the flashiest engine. It is to get to at least 15 points before everyone else does. The cards from this row cost you gems, costing you momentum. This slows you down and makes it harder for you to win by getting the cards that actually do matter. Now, that's not to say you shouldn't buy any of the cards from the first row at all. There will be instances in which you're simply priced out of higher cost cards, have 10 gems in hand, or are just simply forced to buy. Or you see a development that is critical to your opponent's strategy or to your strategy, maybe because it's been scarce all game. If that's the case, it's perfectly reasonable to purchase that development even if it is in the first row because doing so will give you a better chance at winning. But if you can, buy cards from the second row onward, because not only do these developments help reduce the cost of future developments, like all developments do, they also provide an efficient source of points to get you to 15 points faster. Second don't that will help give you an edge, don't focus on nobles too much, too much being the key word. Their presence in the game, along with the three points they provide, can be a bad temptation in getting you to go down a less efficient path. All right, if the nobles are so useless, why are they even in the game? Well, I'm not saying they're useless, but I am saying that focusing on them will result in you playing much less efficiently. And here's what I mean by that. Nobles provide you with three points. But there are other alternatives to get points. These cards right here, these nine, also get you points. And I'm going to demonstrate that these are far easier for you to acquire. So let's say you wanted to get this noble 
who requires three green cards, three blue cards, and three white cards. So let's start on getting the blues, shall we? To get this blue card, we need one white gem, two green gems, and two red gems. So let's get to work. First turn, red, white, green. Second turn, red, white, green. Third turn, you buy this card for one white, two greens, and two reds for a total of three turns. Now, do this eight more times. So let's say three times eight plus the original three that it took, and it's gonna be 27 turns. Now, obviously it's not gonna take you 27 turns to get this noble because buying these development cards will make subsequent developments cheaper. But it tells you just how difficult it can be in terms of uh, number of turns it takes to be able to get this noble. So let's say it'll take you about 15 turns if you're really focused on getting a noble to get one for three points. But hey, here's a card that gives you three points. Let's see how many turns that takes for us to get. And let's assume that the friends you're playing with are really, really bad at Splendor. Well, let's see how many turns it'll take for us to get this card, which gives you three points. First turn, take two green. Second turn, take two green. Third turn, take green black and white, and then fourth turn, you take green, black, and white, and then on the fifth turn, you turn in your six green gems to be able to get this green gem development and get three points. So possibly 15 turns to get, or five turns to get. It's pretty obvious which one is more efficient. And let's take this a little bit more. Let's say you wanted to get this one, two points. Well, how many turns will that take you? It'll take you one, two, three, and four turns. Four turns for two points or Let's say 15 turns for three points. Yeah, the choice here is pretty obvious. Go for these point cards rather than the nobles because the nobles are just that much less efficient. Now, there are cases when you should, and I'll be discussing that in our next tip. Finally, with this tip in hand, we turn to our third don't. Don't forget to analyze the opening board position and use it to evaluate which path to 15 points are the most viable. You'll use this to figure out how to execute your strategy and how to keep others from doing the same through more efficient play or resource denial. While this tip is pretty obvious, I'll throw in some examples of what to consider given an opening board state. In this example, we see that two of the nobles require red and green development cards and this union makes the whole noble strategy a bit more viable. On top of that, we see that the cheaper low-level developments also follow those same numbers. So while I did mention that chasing after nobles might not be the most effective way to go, in this instance, it might be worth gunning for. At the minimum, you should be aware that other people might want to go down this noble path and find some way to hamstring their attempts at doing so if you want to be able to win. In this case, you can see that the nobles are all scattered in their development requirements, so that there's really nothing to chase after that can give you a solid advantage. But then if you go back and look at the development cards, and oh, what have we here? A lot of the developments need green emerald gems to be able to purchase. So if you're able to seize that opportunity, start hoarding the green gems early and often, and the green development cards to be able to make those big point hauling plays. Likewise, if you don't have the initiative to be able to do so, start reserving and blocking your opponents from getting the green developments they need and see if a more viable pathway opens up. 
Hopefully the strategy tips that I've outlined have helped you become a better Splendor player. If you have any questions or have some strategies that you wish to share for Splendor, feel free to comment in the section below. Otherwise, subscribe for more board game strategies so that you can explore a game in greater depth and win more. Thank you very much for watching and have a great day. Bye-bye.